So I'm going to start out breaking, breaking whatever rules I can, right? Good for you. After all, this is a revolution, right? All right. <laughs> all right. I really didn't know where to start with this. Uh, I was teaching at about five, until about 5.30 yesterday evening in College Park, Maryland. It was the last day of the semester, so I couldn't very well leave. And by the time I got into the hotel and hit the bed, it was about 2 in the morning, so I'm not totally here. Uh, you know what Uber wanted to charge to get from the airport to here? You know how Uber is, uh, takes advantage of you, right? $175 is what the Uber price was. I, I, found, sir, I found a taxi for $75, so we're doing all right. I want to start with this. Um, some of you may have visited this place. It's become kind of a tourist attraction. It's in Arizona, out in the desert, although First off, what are they doing with all that grass growing in the desert, right? Well, <laughs> that's good. they're obviously not too, too smart ecologically. But this was supposed to be the pinnacle of our ecological knowledge. Uh, this was started, oh gosh, about 30 years ago. A uh, wealthy individual invested in this first. It then got taken over by a number of universities and research groups. It's called Biosphere 2. I never really found out about Biosphere 1. But it's basically a gigantic sealed greenhouse. It includes uh, some lungs that expand so that the air pressure changes, the greenhouse volume can change so they can keep it sealed. And they think, well, right, we're, we know so much about ecology and how the earth works. We'll be able to really learn if we sort of make this mesocosm, that we can create this world and we're going to monitor everything and monitor all the gases and seal it up and we should be able to create a balanced system. You know, plants produce oxygen and animals use it and well, they had different biomes. So some of these greenhouses were oceans and some were tropical rainforests and some were grasslands and some were agricultural and it was, it was very complex. And then they put some people in it. They called them biospherians. They had a team of young scientists and this is supposed to be all sealed up. After all, it's a balanced uh, ecosystem. So part of their job was to grow their own food. They weren't sending anything in. Right? The water gets recycled. The air is recycled. Well, first, first thing, these people found it was really hard to grow your own food. <laughs> Has anybody ever tried that? <laughs> I had a grad student who many of you know, Joel Groover. Anybody know Joel Groover? It's not too far from here. Everybody, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell Joel that uh, lots of hands went, went up. Well, what, what an interesting guy, huh? Well, he was my grad student years ago, and one year he came in uh, in the middle of his program, he said, for the next six months, I'm only going to eat what I can grow in my garden. That's it. And he had boxes of sweet potatoes and roots and stuff stored in the cooler where we keep our samples. And it was, it was an interesting experience. He started losing weight. <laughs> and he stuck with it. So these folks found it was hard. But worse than that, they were in there for a few weeks and they started getting dizzy and feeling woozy. And they were sort of getting a high altitude sickness, like as if you were, you know, 15,000 feet in the top of the Andes Mountains or something. And they're monitoring all this stuff, and they're running out of oxygen. The oxygen's getting low. I said, well, we had everything in balance. We had enough plants to produce the oxygen. What was going on here? These guys forgot about the soil. So they wanted to grow plants, and so they, they had to put soil into this thing. So they dug up, there was an old uh, lake bed out in the desert, and they dug that up and mixed it with peat moss and compost, created a kind of a potting mix, and filled it to about three, three or four feet deep. Now you know what soils look like, right? The organic matter is at the top. It's not like organic rich all the way down. So they had this huge amount of organic matter in the soil, because that sounded like a good idea. And they stuck it in this ecosystem. And of course, all the bugs in the soil went wild. It's the middle of the desert, so it's hot. And it's totally out of equilibrium. And the soil starts to decompose, right? It's using up all the oxygen, giving all the CO2 up. The concrete, by the way, didn't help either. We often forget about concrete, but uh, that's a carbonate. So they had, it, they had to cheat. These people were going to die. They had to, they had to pump in oxygen and, and cheat. So this was sort of the best efforts. Thought we knew everything. Thought we could create a system. Hmm, wasn't that simple. And the big problem was they forgot about the soil. 
everybody forgets about the soil. It's just like people that study plants forget about the roots. Yeah. How much do you know what's above ground and how much do you, we know what's below ground? It's, well, it's hard, right? If you've ever tried to study roots, it's hard. We don't live down there. It's hard to get, really hard to get samples. Almost nobody does it. They just use some kind of estimate from some old paper someplace, and they say, well, we doubled the top, and it must have doubled the roots, but no, it doesn't work that way. So soils are a really important part of the whole carbon cycle in the world, just like that greenhouse model ecosystem. We can't forget about the soil. It's really important. If you look at where the carbon is, and this is what's driving all this crazy weather, and all this, you know, increased hurricanes, and the rains come and they don't come, and they come too hard, and all this strange stuff we have going on is being driven by too much carbon in the atmosphere. This is the global carbon cycle, and the, and the part of it that's, that's active is up, up here. You know, the, the <clears throat> it's driven by solar energy, of course, and the vegetation <clears throat> have, is a part of it, but there's more carbon in the soil, and you hear this statistic a lot, but not everybody appreciates it. The soil is where the carbon is. Depending on how deep you go and what you include, Three or four thousand, these are pedograms, that's a big number. So there's actually more in the soil than there is in the entire atmosphere of the planet Earth and in all of the vegetation. The soil has been soaking it up and storing it for millennia. So every year, there's about 110 pedograms that are taken out of the atmosphere by the vegetation, photosynthesis. And about 50 goes back in by the same plants. You know, at night, they respire. Right? And most of the difference goes into the soil. That's the dead plants, that's the root exudates, that's all, all of that. Now what goes into the soil and what comes out of the soil ain't in balance. That's a big part of the problem. And that's because of the way we manage soils. It's not just agricultural soils, part of it's the fact that we've got seven billion people on this planet and we've cleared more land and turned more of it into agriculture, forests and grasslands than ever before. So every year, the way we're doing it now, the soils are losing carbon. And anybody that's taken cleared natural vegetation, a forest, or plowed up the prairie, did I say plow? Strike that. That converted the, you know, a grassland to, to cropland knows that under most conditions, you start losing organic matter. So what we really need to do is build this organic matter and change that balance. We have to put more into the soil than what the soil is respiring out and is losing. And you saw it's not that huge a difference, right? 60 in, 62 out. Should be doable. I think it is. If everybody were doing stuff that a lot of the farmers in this room are doing, we'd be making a lot of progress, right? It's, it's sort of scaling up and improving what we do. So organic matter is really kind of an input-output thing. It's like your bank account. You know, and organic matter has these, you can make a financial analogy. It's a little bit like money. There's a quandary. You, know, you can save your money and put it under the mattress, but then what good does it do you, right? You got money, on, you got money under the mattress. Or you can spend it and party, have a good time, buy a new tractor, a new car, take a trip, and then you run out of money. We really want to do both. And we want to do both with our organic matter. We want to protect it, accumulate it, but we also have to spend it. If we want to get the nutrients out of it, we want to feed the food web, we have to use it. We have to keep it cycling. Okay. <clears throat> so let's look at, you know, so organic matter is kind of like a tank that we're trying to fill and most of it comes from plant residues. That's really the only way to fill it. Sometimes we think we can do it by buying organic material, compost from down the road, manure from the feedlot or something like that. But in the big picture, you only do it by growing plants. And some of that comes above ground, but a lot of it comes from below ground. And the below ground stuff's actually more important. There's a little less of it, but It'll stick around longer and it'll have a bigger impact on soil organic matter, the stuff that comes from the roots. So those are the main inputs. 
plant residues, animal waste, manure, and rise of deposition and roots. And that has to be balanced with the, with the carbon going out. We need to know what's coming in, we need to know what's going out so we can make sure that there's always more coming in than going out as far as we can. Now you get to a point where you're probably going to be in equilibrium, but let's hope that's a really good point, right? Most of it's going out by oxidation. All those critters are doing what you're doing right now, digesting your breakfast and breathing out CO2. And the soil is breathing out CO2 all the time, which is a good thing. We just have to make sure we feed it enough, right? Some of it's harvested which is a good thing too, because that puts money in the bank. We have to take some of that carbon away. We have to haul out the, the corn grain or the hay or whatever it is we're taking away. But we have to keep in mind that we're harvesting some of it. But there's no excuse for letting some of it wash down the hill. There's really no excuse anymore. 10,000 years of agriculture, we didn't know how to control that, but we know how to do it now, right? I think there, there's folks in this room probably have seen that difference during their lifetime and they don't worry about erosion anymore because they know how to control it. It doesn't happen on their farm, virtually none. When you're doing no-till and cover crops and minimal disturbance, and keeping that residue mat on the surface, erosion is ancient history. You're almost as good as a forest. But not everybody's doing that. So I hope NRCS, for instance, doesn't forget their erosion, erosion method, message in their drive for soil health. The erosion is still important in lots of places, maybe not so much in this room. Some of it leaches out with the water. It's dissolved organic carbon. It goes down into the groundwater and there's a certain amount of that. And that's a natural process. In fact, that's one of the main ways forests and natural systems lose their carbon. So we have some control over the ins and the outs, just real quickly. Uh, it's, again, it's kind of an input-output, it's like a tank, you've got water going in, and you have a drain, and we can control what's the level of that organic matter, the level of that water, by whether or not we have the drain wide open. And what opens and closes the drain, the biggest control on that is how much we physically disturb the soil. So that's where no-till comes in. So we want to conserve the soil, we want to grow cover crops. Cover crops is just adding more photosynthesis, taking more carbon out that wasn't being done before, right? So it's an added input. And we want to have high productivity. If we have low fertility and poor management, low input agriculture is not conserving anything. There's plenty of low input agriculture all around the world. I work all over the world with poor farmers that can't afford inputs, they're working under marginal conditions and their soils are going downhill fast, literally and figuratively. <clears throat> you, of course, need to return the residues. And that's a question. If you're, if you're doing biofuels, you have to keep this in mind. There's lots of work that shows if you take all the residues off or, or something like uh, silage, very hard on the soil and it, it happens quick. You start taking that residue off, you start bailing it and selling it, and it does not take long. I mean, it just takes a year or two before you start seeing things like infiltration decreasing and your soil fertility going down, and pretty soon your crop production is going to go down as well. So you really have to balance the value that you get from those residues and how much you can afford to take off. You pretty much need to leave at least a third of the production, above ground production, on the soil. Grazing is great. You know, cows get a bad rap. Cows not a really bright animal, those of you that work with cows. They're not the brightest. If you, if you let the cows do the managing, which is what most ranchers and farmers do, they don't do a very good job of it. Right. But if the farmer does the managing in a really intelligent way, controlled grazing, is a benefit to the soil and a benefit to the ecosystem and a big benefit to the farmer's bottom line. Uh, we, could, we could do a whole a session on that if you want to talk about building soils. You want to have maintain moisture in soils. Organic matter is very closely related to moisture. All those processes need moisture. Keep that surface mulch. Already had a lot of things. Appropriate end levels. I'll talk about that a little bit more. 
in, in terms of uh, Jennifer's Goldilocks story and the sweet spot, that's exactly right. Uh, Year-round vegetation. And people often say, well, we only had six months of vegetation in a corn-soybean rotation. Is that true? Six months? What six months? Tell me what six months you've got active roots and covered soil with green vegetation in a corn-soybean rotation. Which months? Is your field covered green? Can you see, see the land in April? In May? When does, it, when, does it, when is it completely covered? When do you have roots all over in the soil? When do you have a vegetated soil? Probably June, right? In July, it looks great. August, pretty good, but what about the end of August? Does it start to senesce? Start to mature? What do you think is happening underground when you see those leaves yellowing in the bottom of the plant? The roots are dying. The roots, the nutrients, basically by the end of August, nutrient uptake is all done. Maybe into September, depends on your growing season. But a long time before you harvest. So really it's June, July, and August. It's not six, it's three months. By September, you just got dead, dead and dying plants out there. The roots are no longer doing much. And they're just sitting there. So you've got three out of 12 months in the typical corn soybean rotation. And we need to get those cover crops in while the crop is still there. While that dead crop is sitting there drying and getting ready for harvest, we want the cover crops coming up and the roots repopulating. Stuff not to do, of course, erosion is the worst, number one. Don't forget about it. It's not a dead issue in most, on most farms. Tillage, but also low productivity, lots of problems, fire. There's still lots of places where they burn crop residues. Did he do that in Kansas at all? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. What can you say? <laughs> uh, total reliance on inorganic fertilizers. I'm not saying inorganic fertilizers aren't a good thing, but when you're totally relying on it to the point where you're excluding any organic sources, then it could be a problem, especially with excessive mineral nitrogen. And using plants that don't have a lot of roots, which is sometimes what is actually aimed for. I've, I've seen engineer types figuring out this biofuel business and say, well, we want plants where we can harvest. We, we don't want them wasting all that photosynthesis energy and putting into roots. We want to have sort of the minimal roots that'll support a plant and then so we can harvest everything and send it to the ethanol plant, right? No, I don't think you're going to get too far with that strategy, but that's what they're working on. And then we have sort of the hard fact that most of the carbon that we put into the soil, whether we're putting it in with a cover crop or with compost or whatever, mostly is going to get respired. It's going to get eaten. It's food for the, all those creatures that Jennifer was talking about. Some are more efficient than others. So some of them breathe out more of it and some of them grow on more of it. But, but this is sort of the, the range that you can expect. You put 100 grams or 100 pounds of plant material into the soil, you can expect, whoops, 60 to 80 percent of that to be respired during the first year. In other words, most of it's going to go, which is good. I mean, that's, that's work in the process, but you can't expect to build organic matter in direct relationship to what you're putting in. Most of it's going to get lost. Some of it's going to turn into living organisms, and they're going to be around. You're going to build a biomass, maybe 3 to 8 percent, pretty similar to what Jennifer was saying. And some of it's going to be various forms of the remaining, either the remaining plant tissue or the microbes, the dead microbes or other forms that have been stabilized. They're going to stay there for a while. And a while might mean decades, it might mean centuries. Sometimes we carbon date this stuff and it stays there for thousands of years. We want some of it to build up. Because really when you think about it, microbes and the organisms of the soil are extremely responsive to food. You put a little food on the soil, they take off. They multiply, they turn on their enzymes, and they use it up. So why is there any organic matter in soil to begin with? Why doesn't it all get eaten up? There shouldn't be any. Yeah? Because it's not all hamburgers and french fries. It's not all hamburgers and french fries. Well, you're implying that the food is, I mean, you think there's some cardboard packaging that doesn't get eaten? <laughs> That's true to some extent, but not much. There are almost any kind of organic food outside of plastics. Most plastics, there's an organism that can eat it. 
You know, the white rod fungi do pretty well on lignin and wood. So biologically, you'd think, well, there wouldn't be any soil organic matter. It keeps coming in that, you know, if you put in more, you're just going to grow more microbes. Why doesn't it all get eaten? The reason is that the products of it end up getting in, into an environment in the soil where they can't get digested, where they're either physically protected or they're chemically absorbed onto clay surfaces. It's one of the reasons why clay soils have a lot more organic matter. It's easier to build up than in a sandy soil. Or the environment may be too cold. Right? If things are cold, the whole thing slows down. So if you're in uh, Canada or North Dakota, in the same rainfall, you're going to have a lot more organic matter than in Texas, just because it's cold. And the cold slows down the decomposition more than it slows down the plant growth. Okay. Or it might be too wet. That's why wetlands and, and low spots and poorly drained soils have more organic matter. Okay. Now we used to think, this is, a, <clears throat> this is a chart from my previous edition of the textbook that I wrote in 2007, and I was behind the times. For, oh, about 150 years, scientists have been studying soil organic matter, and they've really missed the boat. So this might, be, this might be a little hard on you, but this is sort of a traditional way of defining organic matter. Uh, of course, there's the living, there's the dead, and then there's really, really dead. That's Fred Magdoff's terminology. And the really dead is the... Uh, is what we call humus. And we used to think there were these humic substances and non-humic substances. Well, the non-humic substances were things like enzymes and uh, you know, biomass and stuff like that. And the, the humic substances you could extract from the soil. And what they used was sodium hydroxide. So it's been about 150, almost 200 years since they started extracting soil with sodium hydroxide. Standard method. Now, you're, you use sodium hydroxide around the house. One brand name is Drano, right? Concentrated sodium hydroxide. And what do you use it for? Put it down the drain to dissolve organic gunk, like grease and hair and stuff that's in the drain, right? It does the same thing in the soil. It'll dissolve all the organic matter out of the soil, and you'll get this black soup of dissolved organic matter. And almost everything we know about humus has been studied on that black soup that was dissolved out of the soil. Well, it turns out making that black suit really changed the organic matter, dissolving all that stuff. And most of what we thought, of, oh, there's, oh, there's, it's, it's really a shame. There's a humic substances society that's full of scientists that have spent their whole career studying these things in the black soup. You know, this, this uh, humic acids and fulvic acids uh, that come out. So the old idea was that leaves and, or, you know, would decay and they'd decay longer and they'd be used by the microbes and they'd be turned into bigger and bigger molecules that were so complex that they couldn't decompose. That was kind of the, it's not all hamburgers and french fries, I think is what he was probably getting at. First of all, there's no really chemical reason why complexity would make it harder to decompose. But that's the way people thought about it. And secondly, it turns out that that's not really what's in the soil. That's what you get in that black soup when you dissolve it in Drano. But when they, we now have instrumentation that can look at organic matter in the soil through imaging, through spectroscopy, through there's number of MRI and uh, exanes. We have a lot of high-tech kinds of instrumentation that can look at the kinds of chemical bonds that are in the soil and the kinds of molecules that are there. We don't find this stuff. We don't find these huge, complex molecules. So this is what we used to think humus was made out of. And uh, bless their hearts, Schulten and Schnitzer uh, spent their whole career trying to figure out the structure of these molecules. But it was all what's in the black suit. This is what we think is really happening in soil. So this is the diagram for the new edition of my textbook. It came out last year. I think I should have brought a whole box of these because I'd been asked for them, but I didn't. <laughs> They're online. <clears throat> so organic matter, as I said, starts with plant material. There's a nice cover crop profile of mixed cover crop. Plant material and microbes. Okay. 
The microbes take this, whatever the plant is giving, the dead leaves, the dead roots, the root exudates, and most of the microbial, microbial digestion takes place outside of the microbial cell. They exude enzymes, exoenzymes. And this is, breaks down this plant material. Some, it, it creates these small dissolved molecules, so we have a lot of dissolved organic carbon, and that's what the microbes can take up. The sugars, the amino acids, things like that. Okay. So it's kind of a cycle. Now, to help this thing out, these little critters that Jennifer was talking about, the soil animals, the earthworms, the smaller criticals, critters like the columbola and the mites, even some of the nematodes, they can do some shredding. So the, the bacteria don't have any teeth. Even the fungi don't have teeth. It's kind of hard to grind up a leaf and get through the coatings and stuff. So that becomes these little bits of plant tissue in the soil. I've got this unlabeled box at the bottom. I'll get to that in a minute. But the soil is full of these tiny little bits of plant tissue, call it particular organic matter. And some of that gets digested with those microbial enzymes. And then the microbes, of course, are producing molecules, including their own cells. So the microbes are growing on this, and they're using anywhere from 20 to 30 or 40 percent of the carbon to grow on. Fungi are more efficient than bacteria. Some bacteria are more efficient than others. And all the time they're breathing. So a lot of this carbon, as we said, is going up back into the atmosphere. And fortunately, they're also releasing nutrients uh, from this. And, and this organic, this dull organic material is being absorbed, especially onto clay surfaces. Clay surfaces will hold these. And that will prevent it from being decomposed. And it will also be desorbed, so it's in equilibrium. And the microbial biomass is producing all kinds of microbial compounds, and especially cells. So they grow, and then they die. And often the cell walls, that is the debris from the microbes, it's no longer plant tissue. But they're little, they're these, all these tiny cells that are coating the soil particles will get absorbed. The insides of the cells will leak out and decompose and release nutrients, but those cell walls will remain there and be kind of fossilized on the, on the surface. And a lot of the organic matter that builds up is actually these cell walls that are tightly absorbed to clay surfaces. Okay. And of course, during this process, when there are more nutrients than the microbes need to build their cells, they then excrete these into the, into the solution. And that's really promoted, as Jennifer also mentioned, I don't know if you caught that, but those nematodes are really important in keeping the bacteria from growing really big colonies and just holding on to all the nutrients. The grazing, the, the <clears throat> You know how grass gets stimulated when you, when you graze it? The regrowth? It's pretty much what happens to the microbial colonies on these soil surfaces. These critters like the mites and the nematodes come along and they graze these colonies and that stimulates the growth, but it also stimulates the release of nutrients. Okay, so as they graze it, they become excess nutrients and they get excreted. And that's what plants are going to use. They're going to use these excess nutrients. Now there's another interesting wrinkle that we ignored for a long, long time, and that's the product of fire. Fire is a natural part of almost any ecosystem. Over the, over the, over the millennia, there are prairie fires, there are forest fires. It's a natural phenomenon, as we well know if you're from California, right? And for the longest time, we just ignored it because most of the chemical methods we use to measure organic matter, if you maybe have heard of the Walkley Black method, it's from the 1930s, it didn't, it didn't react with this stuff. Charcoal is very resistant to being oxidized. So they just ignore it. It just didn't count. They had a fudge factor. There was a, if you've ever done this, there's sort of a number you multiplied by that was supposed to account for this, but you know, it really, really didn't. We now are looking at soils and realizing that this black carbon is really important. It's very stable for the most part. It has a tremendous amount of surface area. You've heard of biochar. That's where we intentionally make this stuff as a soil amendment. But soils have a lot of this black carbon in it. From the, it's not ash, it's, it's from the low oxygen burning, right? That produces char. And then that's very stable. So a lot of what we, a lot of the properties we ascribe to these mythical humic substances actually are being probably due to some of this black carbon in soils. Especially the grassland, prairie soils, the mollusols, 
uh, have a lot of black carbon in them. Okay. Now, why does it accumulate? Because of conditions in the soil. Not so much the chemistry. Most of these are molecules that we can recognize. They're proteins, they're plant molecules, they're microbial molecules, they're components of cell walls. But they're protected because of the environment. It may be too cold or too wet, either in the whole soil or in microsites in the soil. Or they're adsorbed through metals. So these biomolecules get absorbed onto the clay surface, usually from a metal like uh, calcium or an iron bond. And then the enzymes that normally would break them down can't get to the reactive sites, and so then they accumulate. And that's one of the main reasons why having clay in the soil, or even silt to some degree, will enhance the accumulation of organic matter, because it puts some of this stuff away. It's like taking some of the food and putting it in the freezer where it's not going to, like putting the ice cream in the freezer where it won't melt, I guess. Now this particular organic matter is free to decompose if it's exposed, but aggregates tend to build up around it. So you get, through the process of bacteria and through fungi, they're bringing soil particles together and entrapping little bits of this relatively undecomposed, mostly plant material, also some microbial cells. So this is responsible for protecting and building up organic matter by physically occluding it inside these really small pores where even the bacteria can't get at it. And of course, tillage breaks that up. So this is a real important reason why aggregation is so important. And we're talking about micro-aggregates. They're almost too small to see. But it's the difference between a dispersed soil and an aggregated soil. So these are all conditions that help protect that and this results in some of the organic matter being, whoop, too quick on the trigger here, huh? Some of the organic matter being labile or active, turning over, being eaten up, it's fuel, it's readily decomposable, and some of it becoming stabilized. And I, I still like to use the word humus because we know what it is. It just turns out to be something different than we thought. But it's the stable organic matter that builds up in the soil. Both of them have a function. There's cash flow up here, and there's capital down there. And you need to maintain both. And the only way you can maintain both is to have good income, right? <laughs> and that's what we need to have is a good income so we can spend some. So these aggregates, these are things, uh, if you take, take some soil next time you're out, out of the hotel, wherever you are, some of your own soil, and take a little bit of it and crumble it down. This is one of the psychologically most satisfying things you can do anyway, right? Especially if you're a no-tiller. You dig up a chunk of your soil, and you get a handful of this when it's about the right moisture, and you start crumbling it. And just the way it sort of crumbles and falls apart into these natural aggregates, it's just a very satisfying feeling. It's not sticky, it's not gooey, uh, it's just crumbly. And you do that, and, you, and then you look for the smallest little particles that you can find. Put them on your finger. You think, oh, I found a particle. Now, I'm, I could get rich doing this if you're willing to bet against me. I bet that if you take that smallest little particle you can find and you rub it, it's going to turn out not to be a particle. It's going to turn out to be an aggregate of a thousand particles, even the smallest one. So those little tiny particles that are almost too small to see are really clumps and aggregates, and that's where the organic matter is hiding, and that's what makes the soil function. So we see these big ones that are several millimeters across, maybe a quarter of an inch. Those are nice big aggregates that are held together by roots. But they're made up of these smaller aggregates. So we take a look at a smaller one. That's where the fungal hyphae really become important, gluing these together. These green things are the fungal hyphae. Here's your plant root. But even those are made up of even smaller aggregates. So it's a hierarchical structure. So this is a scanning electron microscope from the University of Bremen that shows how these aggregates are just covered with a net of hyphae. And this is really the sort of hairnet that's holding the soil together. The tillage disrupts and not feeding organic. These, these, these are living. They are eating. They have to have organic matter to keep them going. And then at the really micro state, uh, scale, you can see these little bits of part particulate organic matter and these little clay particles holding it together. 
And then down here, you can see that the clay, at the very smallest scale, the clay is, has, a, has an important function of holding these particles together as well. And remember that these little, egg, these little tiny pores are where the water is for your plants. So one of these insights that I mentioned that may have slipped by you is that we used to think of all this organic matter as being of plant origin, but as Jennifer said, we we're now uh, finding that a lot of it is actually dead bacterial and archaea. Does anybody know what archaea are? It's another thing that's changed since some of us went to high school and learned biology. I never learned about archaea when I was in high school. In fact, I don't think I learned about them in college either. So archaea are a whole other branch of life. There are basically three branches of life on this planet. The bacteria are one of them. The archaea are another. Everything else is in the, like us, are in the eukaryotes. So you are more closely related to a mushroom or a fungal hyphae than the bacteria are related to the archaea even though they look pretty similar under the microscope. So there are all these cells, and not all of them decompose. The cell walls are pretty resistant. They get absorbed. So you have all these sort of absorbed dead cells that are an important part of the organic matter. It's how we store carbon and, and, and nutrients. And then, the, as we said, the conditions, you have to be realistic as to what you can do with organic matter and building it. A lot of it is based on the conditions you have on your farm and where you are uh, this is just an example. <clears throat> if you've got uh, mollusols, grassland soils, uh, in Minnesota, they're going to have more organic matter than uh, forested soils in Indiana will. And if they're poorly drained, that is, they're wetter, they're going to have more organic matter than if they're at the top of the hill and they're well drained because less oxygen means it's going to decompose, and that's going to be true in forested soils and grassland soils, right? So it doesn't take a lot of topography. This is on the eastern shore of Maryland. It's pretty flat, but you get a little bit lower, and you can see much darker soil. That's a tilled field. That's about the only good thing about tillage is that you can see the changes in soil color. So this is an old picture from back when they used to till in Maryland. You know, very few farmers till in Maryland anymore on the eastern shore. And you, can, and you can know, of course, that the kind of ecosystem that was there before you started your farm has a big impact on how much organic matter you're going to build up. I might skip through this. Uh, this was an old experiment that was done in Maryland. And for 20 years, uh, the guy that did this experiment, Ed Strickling, uh, <coughs> had a couple of different rotations. And the extremes were he planted corn every year with tillage versus he left the thing in, in bluegrass sod. Applied the same rates of nitrogen to everything. After 20 years, he grew corn on everything. He plowed it up, grew corn on everything. So he was looking at the impact of different kinds of management. He had different rotations. And I came in and sampled those uh, in the 25th year of this experiment. And the soils looked pretty similar. These were silt loams, not particularly well structured. Uh, but there was a difference in organic matter that occurred after 20 years of difference in management. Uh, you know, growing corn and tilling it reduced the organic matter a little, and growing grass increased it a little. I think it started at around 1.5, so there was a, a difference, and this is percent organic matter, so percent carbon would be about half that. So fairly small difference, but significant after 20 years. But look what happens when you add water to these beakers. And this is what happens when it rains on your field. Same amount of water added to each beaker. You've used up the active organic matter that glues those aggregates together by tilling it and not returning much residue and not having perennial vegetation as opposed to maintaining it. And you can see these aggregates are just maintained. And, they, and this is holding all the water, and this one has just settled down, and it can't even hold all the water. And of course, when it dries, you see that. Now, how many neighbors do you have? I'm sure none of your fields are tilled, but if you walk out into your neighbor's fields, that's what the surface looks like in the middle of summer, isn't it? That's what most agricultural land in America looks like. It's 
especially out in California, just to, to bother Jennifer who works out there now. California, every time I visit California, I think, no, there's our problem, child. How do we solve their problems in their economic environment so that they can do some of this stuff? And I know there are farmers out there that are doing it. So this is something you can take home and do. Do this with your fields. Dig up a few little claws, let them dry on the kitchen table for a few days, and then drop them in a glass of water. And you can score yourself as to how well you're doing. This is one of the simplest and most meaningful tests for, for looking at soil health. Just how does this hold together when it gets wet? This is a soil that's been in permanent vegetation. And this is one that's been not well managed. This happens to be from Africa. You can do this anywhere in the world. Do it here in Indiana, you'll get the same thing. I think, do I have time? I don't know. What's, when is this? Uh, so there's not much time. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about how you can build organic matter uh, through building productive crops. And one of the controversial issues is nitrogen fertilizer, because it really is a Goldilocks situation. It grows bigger crops, which produces more carbon, but it also speeds decomposition. It reduces the carbon to nitrogen ratio, and it also stimulates the decomposition tremendously. So you don't want to have too much of it, aside from the fact that it's wasting money and it pollutes your water and makes your neighbors in Toledo pretty angry with you, right? And it's really the below ground organic matter that you want to build up. So this is one thing we've also learned in recent years is that a pound of roots is worth about a pound and a half of above ground material in terms of building organic matter. Part of that's because of where the roots are. They don't get added to the top, they get added intimately in the middle of those aggregates. And part of it's what the roots are made out of. They have a lot of super in them, which decomposes much more slowly and tends to accumulate. What this study showed, and this was looking at a uh, number of sites in, in the Midwest, was that the relationship between the organic carbon, and this is, this is a long-term study, so after many years, the organic carbon was related to the below-ground inputs much more than to the above-ground inputs. Okay. Basically, fertilizer doesn't grow roots very well. It stimulates top growth much more than, than uh, below-ground. Okay. However, too little nitrogen is also not very smart because you don't grow enough plant material to keep up with the soil respiration and you're falling behind. So if you under fertilize, you know, this is, this is also, so unfortunately none of this is done on no-till with cover crops. So this is cultivated corn. This is a, a recent paper that looked at studies that went on for several decades in Iowa. Uh, but you can see that the, this is the soil organic matter change from the beginning. The zero would be just holding still. And if you're at the lowest fertilizer rates, you were losing carbon. And at the highest, you started coming down again, too. This is continuous corn. With soybeans, it's, it's harder to maintain organic matter because soybean residue decomposes so easily and there's a lot less of it. So every second year, you're putting a lot less carbon in. Okay. So this is the concept, is that adding nitrogen to the point where it doesn't increase yields anymore economically is a good thing. Adding nitrogen from legumes, adding it from manure, adding it from fertilizer, whatever the source. We don't always have that pinned down very well, right? That's one of the, one of the issues that's, that's hard to figure out. How much is the right amount of nitrogen? But we need to figure out what that agronomic optimum nitrogen is. We often miscalculate that. And how many people fertilize for that one year, that mythical perfect year that's going to happen next year, right? You want to have enough fertilizer out for that year. So every year you put out enough fertilizer for that one year that might happen one in ten years or something, if you're lucky. That means the other nine years you're over-fertilized. So that's a problem we need to deal with. And that over-fertilization is eating up your organic matter as well as your bank account 
as well as the patients of your neighbors who are drinking the nitrate in their, in their water supply. Okay. So the problem with accumulating inorganic nitrogen and eventually leaching it is really a problem of excessive application. As long as that nitrogen is at the right amount, we're not creating much in the way of problems. Okay. And of course, the efficiency does go down, which you need to keep in mind. And that's the more fertilizer you use, the less efficient that last bit it is, the less you get back for it. And you don't want to go all the way to zero and start getting negative. What we found with tillage is when we stop tilling, we're slowing down that respiration. We're not exposing all that organic matter and organic matter accumulates. And for a long time, we, thought we had just solved that carbon problem. And the NRCS was all excited about no tillage and it increased carbon. And almost all our samples were right near the surface. And that's where the changes take place first. If you want to see the impact that you're having with your management changes in no-till, you want to measure it in the top couple of inches. But it turns out that if we take deeper samples, maybe we weren't getting that far ahead. We're just not sure on this. Typically, we find in no-till a lot more carbon near the surface than in tilled. But the deeper we go, sometimes these lines tend to cross. It may be that when they, the, people that are using conventional tillage are forcing the roots to go deeper because that surface dries out. And so the deeper roots are putting a little more carbon in there. When we go down to like three feet deep, this is in centimeters, so it's a meter, we often find that that difference in tillage and the overall carbon in the whole profile disappears. Doesn't mean we shouldn't be using no tillage. We're improving the health of the soil up here. We're doing a lot of good things, but in terms of the total carbon pulled out of the air, it may not be that different, you know, depending on a lot of, a lot of other factors. So this was a bit of a uh, disillusionment for <laughs> a lot of us in the soil conservation, but this is, this is just a fact. So we're out of time. We're out, we're out of time. Okay. So I can quit here. I did have a couple of things. I, I wanted to get to this uh, calculation. See if we have time for this. So I think some of us are being a little unreasonable in our expectations as to what cover crops are going to do. And of course, a cover crop, there's huge differences in cover crops, right? The average cover crop, it's a good thing. More and more people are growing cover crops. I'm guessing that we're up to something like 5 to 10%. Uh, does anybody know what the latest statistics are? Can we have a feel for that in Indiana or Ohio? It's about 10% of acreage? Yes, just about a million acres. About, about a million acres of, of, of cover crops in, in Indiana. So that, that's my feeling is that it's pushing up around uh, in different states. Indiana is probably ahead of the game. Uh, it's a pretty good state in that regard. But how good are those cover crops? You know, what's the biomass? How much can you really build organic matter with them? So given what we said, First of all, when you measure organic matter, there's so much of it and it's so variable that you're lucky if you can measure it within 10% of reality. So there's going to be some error. So let's take a soil that's 2% soil organic carbon, which would be 4% organic matter, roughly, which translates to about 40,000 pounds of carbon. Given that error, you can only measure between someplace between 38 and 42,000. So in order to measure a difference, in order to see that you've increased your organic matter from cover crops, you're going to have to increase it for that soil, which is a fairly typical soil for around here, by about 4,000 pounds of carbon per acre. Okay. Now remember, about 75%, and this depends on who's doing the respiring, but about 75% of the carbon you add is being respired. So to get to 4,000 pounds, that's a measurable increase, you're going to need to be adding about 16,000 pounds of carbon in residues. Now remember that residues are only about 40% carbon, so that's about 40,000 pounds of dry matter. In order to just begin to see a change in soil organic matter. Okay. 
So you could do that in about four or five years of a really big cover crop. I mean, that's the cover crops that you let the rye go and you've got a huge, I don't know how many of you measure your biomass, but 8,000 pounds, 10,000 pounds, those are really heavy cover crops. And most farmers aren't brave enough to try to deal with that much. Okay. We now know, I'm sure this has been covered, that the easiest way to deal with it is to plant right into it while it's still alive. And that works really well with most equipment. So for most of our typical cover crops that I see out there, they grow about six, eight inches tall, and then they get killed early in spring. They're probably producing less than 1,000 pounds of dry matter. So at that rate, it might take you know, 40 years before you had a measurable increase in total soil organic matter. You can see the direction you're going in by measuring the active component, but don't, don't expect to see those numbers go up really fast if you're just throwing a little bit of rye out and killing it early. All right, I'm going to stop there, but I wanted to get that back in the envelope calculation in. Okay.